ordinarily uh, in our services uh, here at Crestwood, in our, in our sermon series, uh, we work our way methodically through books of the Bible. It's not always the case. Occasionally we will do topical series or we'll do an overview of a book rather than looking at every single verse. But ordinarily we work our way through, uh, we work our way through methodically and we have been doing that with the book of Revelation. And this evening is, is one of those, uh, is, is one of the times where we're going to see the, the particular benefit of working our way methodically through a book because we are forced by method um, to deal with every passage uh, and, to, and to read passages that, uh, that otherwise uh, might not make it into the rotation if we were simply choosing things based on preference. It forces us to look at passages that are a little more difficult or whose messages are less, uh, less popular than, than other parts of the Bible. And... Um, and we have arrived at, at one of those tonight. And, uh, and rather, than, uh, rather than go on and on about it prior to, let's simply read it and hear what it has to say. So we're going to read Revelation chapter 20. We're going to finish out this chapter tonight. And we are reading verses 11 through 15. Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Let's pray. Lord, we come to this passage tonight knowing that it, as the rest of the scriptures, is your word, is breathed out by you, is true and is useful for teaching, for reproof and correction, for training in righteousness that we may be prepared, equipped for every good work. And so we pray, make our hearts attentive to it tonight, even if we would rather ignore it, even if we would rather disbelieve it, help us to hear you speak and to remember that you always speak truly. Spirit, help us, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. So... This is the judgment before the great white throne that we are reading tonight. This is a picture, symbolic in ways, yes, but a picture of the final judgment that will take place at the last day after the return of Jesus. Uh, so I want to I wanna notice at least three different things uh, about what's presented here, and then we'll sort of close with a question. Um, so first, flip back to the end. Go back to verse 15. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Let's start talking about the nature of divine judgment. The nature of divine judgment. This is uh, the, the final picture of divine judgment given to us in all the scriptures. And the, the picture, the symbol for it, is a lake of fire, okay? Is, uh, is a thing into which you could, you could jump, you know, like a, like a lake, uh, like, like at the cottage or something in the, in the summertime, except that, except that instead of being made of water, it's, it's made of fire. 
And this is one of several pictures of final divine judgment that is given throughout the, the New Testament. Uh, Jesus, in the Gospels, calls it a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Elsewhere in the Gospels, it's likened to the Valley of Hinnom, or, or Gehenna, which was a place near Jerusalem that was associated with divine judgment because it was a place that the, the kings of Israel had sacrificed children in service to Canaanite gods. Or Jude calls the, the final act of divine judgment, he refers to it as utter darkness that lasts forever. And Jesus alludes to the same picture of of flame or fire that we see here in Revelation 20. He alludes to the same thing, the same idea, in Mark chapter 9. Um, I'm going to read that, that, that portion just for a second. It's Mark chapter 9, verses 47 and 48. <clears throat> this is Jesus teaching about temptation to sin. Uh, and he, this is where he says, you know, if, if, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. And if your hand causes you to sin, uh, cut it off and throw it away because it's, it's better to, to, to go to heaven missing an eye or missing a hand than it is to keep your entire body and go to hell. So Mark 9, 47 and 48. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Okay, Jesus gives two more pictures, two more symbols of the final act of divine judgment. He, he pictures a sort of burrowing, parasitic worm that will never die. Uh, and he also pictures a, a fire that is never quenched. Now, I don't know that any of those are necessarily literal descriptions of hell, whether there is actually fire or actually worms or things like that. That's not entirely clear, uh, especially since in my mind, eternal fire and eternal darkness, as Jude calls it, doesn't necessarily go together, okay? But they are very clearly giving a picture, giving some frame of reference for us based on our experiences in this world of what everlasting divine judgment is like. The point is that what, what befalls those who are condemned for their sins at the last day is a place of everlasting and conscious torment and pain. Its everlasting nature is made clear in, in several places. That's what Jesus says in Mark 9. Jude also calls it outer darkness that, that lasts forever in his letter. And all of the descriptions speak to its conscious nature. Weeping and gnashing of teeth are things we do consciously and we're, we're aware of. Burrowing worms and stinging fire are only worrisome if we're aware of them, if we're experiencing them. The book of Revelation and other places throughout the scriptures are describing some sort of eternal torment that is spiritual, and I think it's fair to assume also physical in nature. The consequences of our sins are muted in this life. We still experience them to some degree. We go through sickness. We experience pain and loss. We die, and, and people that we know and love die. Evil and violent things can and do happen to us in this life. And yet God also shows us much kindness in this life too. Things are, no matter how much we might convince ourselves they are, things are not as bad as they could possibly be. And we all experience pleasure and happiness and laughter and companionship and love and all of those other good things that life has to offer. We all experience them in varying degrees. Whether you are a believer or not, those are all things that come to us during this life. We call this common grace. 
that God shows undeserved kindness to, to everyone. That's what makes it common. Okay? We all experience joys and, and pleasures and, and some of the lovely things that life is supposed to bring. We all experience those things in this life. Life is a, a mixture of joy and pain. The nature of divine judgment is that it is eternity spent apart from any of God's undeserved kindness. The pleasure, happiness, and friendship that cut through the miseries of this life are all gone. It is only the hatred, misery, suffering, and pain that sin brings for all of eternity. It is the worst parts of life, magnified many times over, and absent the undeserved kindness that God shows to everyone in this life. That is divine wrath for sin. It is the curse of the fall, the curse and consequence of sin, absent the kindness that God shows to everyone in this life. Whatever actual physical form that may take, that is a horrifying thought. That is the lake of fire. That is the nature of divine judgment. That is what is pictured, what is on offer here. So, let's move on to how folks are sorted into into the lake of fire or not. So we start with the nature of divine judgment. It is eternal conscious torment and pain. It is the the curse for sin, absent God's kindness. So let's move on and talk about the weight of the reading of the books at the great white throne. We're going to read again verses 12 and 13. Twelve and thirteen. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. This is the the beginning part of this where all of the dead are suddenly now standing before the throne. This is what we call the general resurrection. That at Jesus' return, every person who has ever lived returns to life. And they are reunited with their bodies. The sea gives up its dead. Hades, the place of the dead, gives up its dead. No one is forgotten about. No one uh, slips through the cracks. And everyone stands before the throne of God. And it says that books are opened. And notice that there are two different kinds of books that it mentions that are opened. One is called the book of life. And we're going to return to that one in a moment. The other is just referred to as books. And, uh, and presumably there are many of them. It's written in the plural. And it says that the dead are judged according to what is written in the books. And that is further elaborated on as being what they had done in life. Okay? The picture, the image that's being given is of volumes of books, many, many tomes that belong to the Lord, written and kept by Him, that detail everything each one of us has ever done. This is what those not written in the book of life are judged according to. And I don't know about you, but that idea freaks me out. Um, Many of us like to think of ourselves as good people. Uh, And of course, humanly speaking, there are many lovely people. Uh, People who on balance are fairly kind and helpful and thoughtful and and all the rest of it. There are people you would rather spend time with or have a conversation with compared to others, right? That's true. That's not hard for any of us to, to grasp. But that's not the measure for eternity. That's not what's happening 
in the reading of these books. The measure here is perfect, lifelong conformity to the law of God, which touches not only outward actions, but also words and thoughts and and dispositions of the heart. Jesus tells us this. He says, you you may not commit adultery, you may not You may not commit the physical act of infidelity against your spouse, but you also may not look at someone else with lustful intent. It it has to do with your physical actions, but also the things you think about and the things that you want. He also says you may not murder. You may not commit the physical act of, of taking someone else's life unlawfully. But he says, you also may not speak or think hatefully or contemptuously about others. It has to do with outward action, but also the things we say and the things we think. The Lord's bar for human purpose and dignity is very high. We are supposed to be here to love and to serve him and to work together as a community for our mutual benefit so that every person may flourish, and yet we tend to be selfish, and we hurt ourselves, and we hurt others, and we neglect the Lord. Even even the very best among us have moments, things that they have done, and perhaps things they have done many times, or many things that they have done, that they deeply regret, that they wish that they had never done, and that they hope that no one knows about. So to have these books read is to bear the weight of everything wrong we have ever done, thought, or said, or things we ought to that we have left undone, unthought, or unsaid. The very nicest sinners, and there are many of those, a lot of them are in this room, the very nicest sinners fall far short of the standard of perfect obedience in worship, love, and service. And all of us are not nearly as nice as we think. There are many things I've done, thought, and said that I wish no one would ever know about. There are things I've done or said and especially thought that I'm ashamed of And I know we all have those things. These books are written by God. They're not written by some human observer who, who catches the things that we do publicly but misses the things that happen privately. They are written by God. He sees and knows all. And nothing escapes his notice. It is the things written in this book that will send us to the lake of fire, apart from Jesus. We'll get there in a minute. And as I think about this, I reflected on the truth that we all have a tendency to get at least a little bit snooty. We spend long enough in primarily Christian circles And we start to think of ourselves as a little bit better than the unwashed masses out there. Better than the progressives or the feminists or the liberals or the Muslims or or whoever. We get like this because we forget what the real test of goodness is. We feel very comfortable uh, comparing the best of ourselves against the worst of our enemies. But that's really not the question, not the important one, when we stand before the great white throne. The question is whether we can withstand having our entire lives read aloud from a book written by the all-knowing, all-seeing hand of God. And if the answer is no, then we should humble ourselves. And then we should turn our attention to the other book. So let's talk about that one. We talked about the nature of divine judgment. We talked about the weight of the reading of the books before the great white throne. And now the freedom of the reading of the book of life. 
You notice from before that there were two different kinds of books that were mentioned. There were the books that have everything we've ever done written in them. It's a horrifying thought, and it's true. And then there is the book of life. It says that those whose names are not written in the book of life are thrown into the lake of fire, which implies that those whose names are written in the book of life do not go into the lake of fire. They do not experience divine wrath. So, what is the book of life and whose names are written in it? It is mentioned in various places throughout the scriptures. It comes up in the prophecy of Daniel. It's mentioned a few other times in the New Testament. But the one that I think gives us the clearest picture of it and, and who is in it and what it means is from the book of Revelation, is a few chapters earlier in verse 13. So on the off chance that you don't have it memorized, uh, let's go back to Revelation chapter 13. And we'll read verse 8. Start at verse 7. The second half of verse 7. And authority was given it, talking about the beast, to make war on the saints and to conquer them. Sorry, authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Okay? Notice the two descriptions that are given of the book of life here. That it was written before the foundation of the world, that's number one. And that the book is of the Lamb who was slain, that's number two. From the foundation of the world, God decided that he would redeem a people to be his own. That he would redeem their lives from the guilt and misery of sin. That he would call a people to be his special possession from the whole world. And the name of every person who would belong to this people were written into a book. It has countless names. It has names that sound familiar to Western English speakers like us, and it has names we could never hope to pronounce. It has names of people from every tribe, nation, and tongue the world over throughout the ages. And when the time was right, God sent and will send His Holy Spirit into each of those people's lives such that they confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, because Paul says those people will be saved. Not one name written in the book will be forgotten. Not one person will be missed. It is the book of the people who belong to the Lamb who was slain. Jesus, throughout the book of Revelation, is called the Lamb. It's a reference to his sacrificial death on the cross where, as Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he became sin even though he knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And as Isaiah said in his prophecy, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all and by his wounds we are healed. Just as Lambs were offered as a blood sacrifice to atone for the sins of the people before the arrival of Jesus. So Jesus is offered as a once-for-all sacrifice so that anyone, anywhere, from any place, with any background that puts their faith in him will be forgiven for their sins. And these things happen because their name was written before the foundation of the world in the book of life. The reading of the books at the great white throne is all about deeds. Whether you read from, from the books that contain everything that we have done or whether you read from the book of life, they are all about things that have been done. Every single person will either stand before the throne, 
hearing their life recited to them, bearing the weight of their own deeds, hearing everything they have done, and bearing the justice of God for their sin. Or they will stand having their name read from the book of life, which means that the weight of their deeds has already been borne by the Lamb who was slain. And the deeds that are attributed to them are those that belong to the perfect righteousness of Jesus. Those people, justly, are not cast into the lake of fire because Jesus does not deserve the lake of fire. Those people, justly, enjoy eternal life glory and pleasure because the righteousness of Jesus deserves those things. Everyone is dealt with justly at the throne. We bear responsibility for our own actions or that responsibility is borne by another. Those are the only two options. So what shall we do? <laughs> what does this mean for us here and now? The day is coming, but is not yet here. So what does it mean for us here in Edmonton tonight? If your faith is in the Lord Jesus, if you have confessed him as Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, then believe, No take comfort that your name is written in the book of life and then follow him follow him in faith repentance humility and love the things that make your calling and election sure your name will be read from one of the two books you can stand alone but the weight of the things that you have done is impossible to bear. Or you can stand according to the deeds of another. His perfection, love, and grace are more beautiful than you could possibly imagine. So if you have not professed such faith, take this as an opportunity to do just that. To have the things written about you in the other books blotted out. All of your iniquities erased from their pages. Because Jesus has borne them in your place. And then take comfort that your name is written in the book of life. That another stands before the throne in your stead. And that you shall not be cast into the lake of fire but shall enter into your Lord's joy forever and ever. More on that next week. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Jesus who stands in our place that we might enter into eternity not bearing the weight of our own guilt and shame but standing joyfully strongly expectantly in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Amen Let's stand and sing.